If I ask you to imagine something like the sun peeking over a mountain during an early morning rainstorm, do you see it with rich visual detail like a movie? Or at the other end of the spectrum, do you not really have any internal picture at all, but instead just a concept? In an earlier episode, we tackled the spectrum of internal visual imagination from hyperfantasia at one end to aphantasia at the other end. How does your experience differ from other people's and what does this have to do with the mind's eye or the mind's ear or how your brain cobbles together the skills that you have to nail the tasks before you? Welcome to Inner Cosmos with me, David Eagleman. I'm a neuroscientist and an author at Stanford, and in these episodes, we dive deeply into our three-pound universe to uncover some of the most surprising aspects of our lives. Today's episode returns to an issue that I hit a little while ago about how we visualize on the inside. Specifically, we talked about aphantasia and hyperphantasia. In aphantasia, you just don't picture anything in your head when you're asked to visually imagine something. And in hyperphantasia, it's like a movie going on on the inside. And every one of us is somewhere on this spectrum between these two endpoints. And if you heard that episode, you know that I talked with Ed Catmull, who's the founder of Pixar Films. And Ed was surprised to discover a while ago that he is aphantasic. And when he quizzed some of the best artists and animators at Pixar, he was even more surprised to discover that many of them were aphantasic. So the key lesson that emerged from that episode is that we each have our own experience of reality. But most of the time, we assume that our experiences are human universals. It never even strikes us that other people might be having a different reality. And this is something we've seen in the scientific community, even very recently. Some researcher will introspect and think about how they're experiencing the world, and then they will argue that that is how brains work. They're operating under the assumption that all brains are having the same experience on the inside. It's a very reasonable assumption. It just turns out to be incorrect. Now, that episode on how we imagine on the inside, that turned out to be a very popular episode. I got a lot of emails about this. And I think this is because it's a real eye-opener to almost everybody when they realize that it's difficult to know whether your version of reality is true for everybody. You only know that it's true for you. And when things get subjected to rigorous study, it often turns out that there's a different experience going on from person to person. And one thing that was very interesting to me and came out of these emails was this question about how people lean into their own strengths and compensate for their weaknesses with the end result being that you often just don't know from looking at somebody's behavior or performance what that person can or can't do on the inside. And I was reminded about this issue of how the brain might cobble together lots of ways of accomplishing a task when Ed Catmull told me about his interaction with Glenn Keane, who's one of the best animators that Pixar has ever known. I didn't play that clip in the earlier episode, but I wanted to concentrate on that now. When I had my dinner with uh, Glenn Keane after we had the results, because uh, as I mentioned, when I first met with Glenn, he said, yeah, he can't visualize and he knows it and it's just part of his skill. So Ed had run an internal study at Pixar and found that many of the great artists and animators couldn't visualize. That was a much more normal thing than would have been expected. And Ed presented those results to Glenn. Then he said that he felt relieved because he was always a little worried that something was uh, was wrong with him. And I was surprised at that one because he was, he was so good. But it was also true of some of the people 
with aphantasia was they they felt relieved because they felt there might be something wrong with them. And I thought, well, okay, that's curious. It's understandable. And the terminology that's frequently used is one of a deficiency. It's like the mind blind eye which is a phrase that's frequently used when people write about it. A blind mind's eye, right? Yeah, blind mind's eye. So, uh, and I, I I never really liked the term because I didn't feel like I had a blind mind's eye. I didn't feel deficient in that way. It was just like I had a different set of skills. So the negative terminology wasn't helpful to them and it was like a curious thing where people felt like they were deficient when actually the quality of their work was in, was extraordinarily good. Let me make sure I understand the story, though. Was that um, Glenn felt that way before he understood what aphantasia was? I mean, the reason I ask is because most people assume that everyone else's reality is the same as theirs on the inside. Did he have a sense in some way that that he was different even before he understood about aphantasia? Well, he did know that he couldn't visualize before all this took place. So I think in some people's cases, I would say this is true with others too, and some of the others who were storyboard artists at at Disney uh, said they knew that the others could work faster than they could and they felt deficient in their ability to to uh, operate at that speed but they didn't say anything in in Glenn's case he said that he knew that he couldn't visualize because he'd had this discussion with his his mentor about it but it wasn't until after the result came out that he said that he felt relieved initially he didn't say that, that he thought there was any problem so there's a little bit of something inside of people saying oh, maybe there's something wrong with me because I can't do it. Again, that was Ed Catmull, the founder of Pixar Films. He is aphantasic, and you can hear my full interview with him on episode 59. Anyway, so many people contacted me about this that I decided it was time to do a second episode on this topic with a deeper dive into the science. So I called a friend and colleague of mine, Joel Pearson, a professor of cognitive neuroscience at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia. Now, you may remember I had Joel on the show a little while ago to talk about the science and psychology of intuition, as in what it is, when to trust it, when not to trust it. But I had him back now to speak more about aphantasia and hyperphantasia and all of the studies that his lab has done on this. So here's my interview with Joel Pearson. Okay, so Joel, tell us what is aphantasia? Well, it's the name to describe a complete lack of visual imagery. Now we can dig a little bit deeper and talk about imagery in the other senses, but primarily it refers to people that either acquired or lost their visual imagery or were born without any visual imagery. And, and what percentage of the population are we looking at that has aphantasia? Yeah, kind of a controversial question. So it seems to be between, say, 2% and 4%, give or take. I think it's probably more like 5 to 7%, because a lot of people I talk to who have it or discover that imagery exists, they never realized imagery actually exists. They always thought it was a metaphor, and the mind's eye was simply a metaphor. So they're shocked. And so I think the way people measure it with questionnaires is actually under, under measuring the total number. Yeah. So I think it's yeah a little bit higher, yeah. five six percent. Sounds right. So you know, back in 2007, I did this paper where we did brain imagery and showed that we could correlate what someone's subjective report is on the vividness of visual imagery questionnaire to their brain imaging. But you've done something even cooler and simpler than brain imaging, which is pupillometry. So tell us, explain to us what that's about. Yeah, this is a paper. So we've been on this quest to try and have objective measurements of visual imagery. And the pupil measure was simply, we get participants into the lab and they have to imagine bright objects or dark objects, right? So if you look at a bright object or a dark object, we actually use little triangles. So if you look at the bright triangle, your pupil constricts, right? Bright light. When you look at the dark thing, it relaxes and opens up. And it turns out if you have someone imagine the same shapes, a light or a dark triangle, the pupil would do a similar thing, right? So simply by imagining a bright light, 
it contracts, which is pretty cool in itself, right? And it turns out um, you do that in the normal population, let's say, to people with typical imagery, you get this effect. Then you got people with aphantasia into the lab and we didn't see the effect. So their eyes, their pupils don't constrict, right? And then the question is, well, are they, are they faking it? They just don't want to do it because they think they have aphantasia, right? It's some sort of psychological thing. And we have this other condition where we have, rather than just one triangle, we have two or three or four triangles. And you see this set size effect, which seems to be linked with the, the sort of cognitive and mental effort. So unpack the set size effect. Yeah, so, so when there's more triangles, you see a, a more of a general dilation independent of the bright or dark condition, right? And that just seems to be like people are trying harder with more triangles. And the cool thing is you see this set size effect in both groups, in people with imagery and people without imagery, people with aphantasia. So it suggests they are trying as hard as they can or they're trying pretty hard because these set size effects there, but there's no difference in the luminance or the brightness of the shapes. So they're trying, but something's just not happening in their brain. It's not happening in visual cortex. Whatever is driving that pupil response is not there. So, And is it a clear enough effect that you can just ask somebody when they tell you that they're aphantasia, you can say, hey, picture a bright triangle. <laughs> can you do it that way? And say, I, I don't right? know if you can do, like, do it right now. I could like, what's your pupil? Um, you probably did lots of trials under the right conditions. Um, I, I think it'd be cool to try and you know have a, a phone test of that where you could yeah. just test that in anyone, anytime. But yeah, the, the data was pretty clear and it, it, it correlated with other measures of visual imagery we have in the lab. So it was nice to see the different techniques sort of come together. Yeah. And you and I know lots and lots of people with aphantasia who are terrifically successful in their careers. Yeah. For example, we both are friends with Ed Catmull, who I interviewed in a previous episode. And there's, you know, this very famous software engineer who's aphantasic and nonetheless did all the UI for the for Mozilla. One of the engineers at, at my company, Neosensory, is aphantasic, and yet he's a terrifically creative engineer. So you've studied the issue about what are the strategies that people with aphantasia are using. So tell us about that. Yeah, so it depends what we're talking about. We're talking about so uh, working memory, so holding information in short-term memory and visual information. People with imagery or people with no imagery have different strategies. So I have imagery, and if I have to remember, you know, like like how many cups you have in front have in front of me, I'm going to basically imagine those cups why I'm trying to hold it in memory. And that's my mnemonic strategy, to use a technical word. People without imagery won't do that. They have to use, and it's not just one other strategy. There seems to be a bunch of different strategies. So they'll use words, geometry, locations in space. So there's a range of different compensatory mechanisms or strategies, if you like. And they're, they've been practicing, most of the people have been practicing those strategies their whole life, right? So they're very good at it. So if you just look at uh, the performance data, it can look exactly the same in some of these memory tests, these short-term working memory tests. And then we see this sort of strategy difference across the board in other um, other things we've measured as well. Yeah, and it's funny because you and I both and several other researchers around the planet figured when we first learned about aphantasia, figured, oh, we can just do some simple tests on this. And we were surprised to learn that on many tests, you can't really find a performance difference. And it's precisely because of this, right? Because people figure out other strategies to get by in the world. And I mentioned to you the other day my uh, my hypothesis about why really good artists and animators like at Pixar, maybe why they be why aphantasics are more likely to become good artists. This is just a dumb hypothesis, but I figure if you're a kid and you're hyperphantasic and someone says draw the horse, you know you, you sort of know what a horse looks like and you draw what's there. But if you're aphantasic you really have to stare at the model and you have to figure out what the heck's out there and you have a dialogue with the page and you you get more practice that way is the hypothesis. And that's why, even though it seems like a surprise at first that Pixar found that it had so many aphantasic animators there, maybe it's not such a surprise because they were learning different strategies in life and ended up becoming better artists that way. Yeah, I think exactly. And, and um, what is it, Glenn Keane? That's his name? Yeah, yeah, the, the, yeah. the animator at Pixar. When you see, you've seen the footage of him yeah. where he embodies the, the the motions, the movements of his character. And he's like jumping around. If you're watching the video, I'm, I'm sort of moving around on the chair, right? And so he, he has to almost feel it in his body, I think, before he draws it. So I've sat down with people with, with aphantasia and said, you know, draw an apple and they just draw a beautiful, perfect, almost perfect apple, right? I said, well, how do you know what you're going to draw before the pen touched the paper? And he was like, I don't really. As, as I'm drawing it, I know I know what an apple looks like. I know it looks like an apple, so I just keep drawing, right? Which is, which is different to how I draw an apple. But again, the strategy 
probably the brain mechanisms are different there, but but you still get a very similar uh, outcome. Also, you found that people can be perfectly good at facial recognition, and yet they're aphantasic when they're trying to picture a face internally. Tell us yeah, about that. This is a, so this is a thing called prosopagnosia, where people have just trouble recognizing just faces, right? Nothing else. That no perception's normal. Comes to a face, show them a picture of Brad Pitt. They're like, mm, I don't know. They they can use the hair or the clothes, right? And that's perceptual. Now we've found a few cases of people that have what looks like prosopagnosia, but only in their imagery, which is pretty wild, right? So they have, I don't know, prosopagnosia aphantasia. We haven't got a, a good name for this, and we've just started studying this. But yeah, they don't seem to be able to imagine human faces. And when you ask. Can, oh, they say they've got a dog or something. And you say, can you imagine the dog's face? They say, yeah, sure, no problem. It's just the human face, which is super specific, right? Now, I should also at this point say that aphantasia is not just purely visual. In the studies we've done, it, it goes, there can be full multi-sensory aphantasia. So no mind's ear, no mind's smell or taste, none of the, none of the senses. In the studies we've done, people either seem to have, most people have pure visual aphantasia or multi-sensory the other other sort of subtypes of the pure auditory aphantasia are very, very rare. And so let's describe what auditory aphantasia would be. So you say, okay, picture Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. The yeah. person says, I just have no idea. Or, you know, picture had the happy birthday song. In your head, do you hear it? Somebody who is hyperphantasic in that way says, oh, yeah, it's like a symphony. I'm hearing the thing, but uh, but other people don't hear it. Yeah, so it's like they just can't get the earworms, the name for these songs, that get, these annoying songs that get stuck in our head, right? Um, so that they have no mind's ear, if you like. They can't. Now, I should say that in the studies we've done, a lot of a lot of the publicity around aphantasia is, is around pure visual aphantasia. So there's always a bias there when we're collecting data in, in our database, our international database. Um, a lot of those have reached out to us because they've heard about, again, pure visual imagery. So there could be a bias there in selecting the participants as well. So my impression, but you've got data on this, which I want to ask you. My impression has been that it's actually a dice toss on anything. Like somebody might have visual aphantasia, but they've got perfectly good ability to imagine something auditory, but not so good at imagining, let's say, how their muscles would feel if they were going up 20 flights of stairs, but they're perfectly good at at smell fantasia. And and it's just, it, each one it is felt to me is sort of a random toss of dice. But have you found clustering that tells well, the story? Yeah, the, I mean, the multi-sensory, the, across the board is the largest group, really. That and, and pure visual, but that's probably a bias. And by that, you in, mean someone who has aphantasia across all the senses. Yeah, which is pretty, if you think about it just for a second, it's something that, that always struck me. What is the equivalent in perception? There's no like natural occurring multisensory blindness, right? And so spatial neglect or something might be the closest thing to that, but that's not blindness. So that's an interesting way that, that aphantasia or imagery differs from perception, right? You just, the chances of, of being blind and having no taste and being deaf and all, through all the senses is, I don't know what probabilities are, but it's, I, I've never come across someone like that, right? Right, right. I, I don't know if it exists even. I, uh, I, yeah, it would certainly be very unlucky to have that. That's right. But of course, it makes sense because you've got all these windows on the world that pick up on different energy sources, whether photons or compression waves or mixtures of molecules. And then, but imagery is, you know, this this uh, multicolor theater that you're putting together on the inside in the darkness, in this hurricane of electrical spikes, where you're putting together a model of the world. So if there's some problem in that, in, you know, maybe it's a form of consciousness, essentially, that says, okay, here's how I put this together to make this theatrical play. Yeah, it's, uh, that's a really interesting clue into what's going on there. Yeah, nicely put. You should write a book, David. <laughs> so, okay, but do, do you also find people like I did where it's, you know, it's one and not the other and they're perfectly good at hearing but not at the visualizing? Yeah, stuff? the hearing is less common, but there is, yeah, there is auditory aphantasia. And then there's a sort of a sub, there's questionnaires for this where the people will be able to get to have a song in their mind, but they won't be able to have, they, they won't have the voice in their mind, right? So they're in a monologue, this inner dialogue thing. Like so a lot of people, when they read a book, they'll hear a voice, some version of their own voice, sort of saying the words in their mind. And some people won't have that, but they'll still be able to, you know, sing a song or listen to music in their mind's ear. So that's another, you know, even more specific category. You know what this all reminds me of? So, so okay, in my book Incognito, I wrote about this team of rivals framework, which is you've got all these neural networks that are all doing different things, and you've evolved lots of these over the, you know, eons. And so you've got all these different ways of doing things. 
So one of the classes I teach here at Stanford is literature in the brain. And one of the questions with literature is if you just read some passage from Hemingway, are you inside the character or are you watching as though watching a movie, seeing the characters there? And so I really queried the students on this very carefully. And what it seems is that we're doing both. We do both and we kind of switch back and forth. If you force someone to answer, they'll do one or the other. Interesting. Well, in, in, independent of how the, the first person, second, how the book's written. It, exactly. Yeah, yeah, if it's yeah, just yeah. Some, some Hemingway-esque scene where it's like some guy's talking and mm. doing something. The question is, are you the guy or are you watching the guy? Yeah. And it certainly seems like we bounce back and forth pretty seamlessly there. So this all comes back to this point you were making about all the different strategies that people have to solve whatever kind of problem. And maybe visualizing something is just one of, you know, eight different ways that you can get through any problem. Yeah. And, and the, you mentioned books there. I think it's interesting. So there are some studies going on at the moment looking at uh, how much people with aphantasia enjoy reading fiction, for example. Because a lot of on the online discussions, there's a, there's a huge amount of people saying, I find fiction boring. I don't get into it. And we've run a study where we had people come into the lab and read these scary stories, right? They're swimming and something bumps their foot and they see a dark shadow and a fin comes past them and it kind of builds and builds until the shark attacks. And when you have someone with imagery read that in a dark room with one of those skin conductance things on their finger, right? Measuring these slight changes in sweat, uh, you see this nice increase in their sort of, uh, their, their sweat and their heart rate goes up and things like that. People with aphantasia, not so much, pretty much flat lines. Right, so just so all, all they're doing is reading the words on a screen. So that sort of from that those data, you could sort of put the story together that yeah, then they're not going to be as emotionally engaged when they're reading fiction. Oh, that's fascinating. And I assume it's the same if they're listening to an audio book. I think so. We haven't done that with the audio yet, but interesting. Yeah, it seems like it would be if the problem is actually visualizing what's going on. Yeah, I mean, you could take go one step further, right, and say that if you have strong imagery and you're listening to an audio book or a podcast while you're driving. And you have this vivid imagery, right? It's going to be way more dangerous, right? You're going to, you're, you're time to break. You're going to have, like, it's like having a high blood alcohol level. So, I mean, let's be clear. We haven't tested that. It's just a hypothesis, but um, yeah. Oh, fascinating. I mean, yeah. the thing that is, has always fascinated me the most in lots of my episodes involved, this is just the diversity from head to head, how, how different people's realities are. Yeah. And, and, you know, maybe there's this question, driving tests in 100 years from now, not that there will be self-driving cars, but if there were, you know, would they say, okay, look, we need to test you for this. And if so, then we're going to make sure your car can't go close enough to the I, car. I, I, it's, it's, on, it's on our to-do list of experiments, but I think it could be a thing. Or just talking on the phone, right? You're just visualizing what the other person's saying. It's going to make yeah. a difference. Now, how does this pan out in a court of law? If somebody is hyperfantasic and has very vivid imagery, does that mean it is any more accurate? So there's some data to suggest that, yeah, that when your imagery is more vivid, your memories are more likely to be corrupted, right? Wow. So you saw something yesterday and I say, and then today, then, then I say, oh, was there a red car there? And you try and remember back and you imagine a red car, it's very vivid. You have the, the original memory, red car, they're happening together. And then the next day I say, was there a red car? And your memory comes back and bang, the red car's glued onto that into that scene, let's say. And now you remember with a red car, right? If your imagery is less vivid, uh, weaker, then that probably shouldn't happen as much. There's some evidence to suggest that. And we're running some studies now looking at this idea of false memory, false memories, and if they're going to pop up more with strong imagery. Yeah. And so one of the other classes I teach here is the brain and the law. Um, and I always teach about eyewitness testimony and the, the difficulties there like this, but I had never considered this question of whether eyewitnesses should be tested for their uh, position along the Fantasia spectrum it's, so you have yeah. some sense of whether they're less likely to be accurate. And it's, it's I, th I think of imagery as just a format of our thoughts, right? Uh, like this is, this is distribution. Most people are somewhere in the middle here, this normal distribution. And each tale, you have the, the strong hyperphantasia or eidatic imagery, as it was called sort of a couple of decades ago, and then people with aphantasia. People say, is it a disorder? Is it a condition? What do, we, what do we call it? I don't think, I don't think it's not a disorder. That's, that's, there's no, we shouldn't diagnose it. There's no, think about a cure, none of that, right? It's part of the normal neurodiversity, cognitive diversity that we all, you know, live in. But like you said, it, it will change a range of things. And that's what we're testing now. It does change. If your thoughts have a different format, it, it is going to change, you know, a bunch of things in life. So it does change things. Yeah. One of the things I study is, you know, is synesthesia. 
And it's the same issue where it's not a disorder, it's not a disease state, yeah. it's, just, it's just a different way to perceive reality. And so tell us about alexithymia. You had mentioned uh, to me the other night that there's a, a relationship here. Yeah, so we ran this, this large study. So first define it, sorry. Yeah, so alexithymia is this condition um, where people sort of have a lack of emotional response or they, they feel less emotion. And they're not very good at diagnosing not, yeah, it themselves so it, or others. Yeah, it's you could say it's, no, I won't say it's towards the spectrum of autism, but it's kind of in that realm, right? And it's the, some links to psychopathy. So we were testing this as part of a larger project looking at empathy, right? And so we measured empathy uh, with questionnaires, with pictures, with these paradigms where you've, you know, here's a, a horrible disease. Would you donate to this cause and not for profit? We had showed people videos across the board and all those things. People with imagery scored higher in, with empathy than those with aphantasia. And why? Well, that's the question. So, so we thought, we, we, our original hypothesis was that with the questionnaires, you'd see it, but once you had a video or a picture, there should be no difference because imagery shouldn't make a difference, right? But it seemed to, even with the videos. So we think it's, 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 it's initially like if, if you're being described with a scenario and you can conjure it up and imagine it, you have this virtual reality thing coming up, you're going to feel more for that individual or whatever, whoever it might be. And over the years, that happens more and more and more. So overall, your empathy builds and gets stronger. So it's the role of imagery in the moment, but it's also a developmental thing. So then we started testing alexithymia as part of that. And that sort of is part of that experiment. Yeah. And you had interviewed a uh, memory champion with aphantasia, tell, which is so surprising, right? But it's surprising because of her technique that she used. Yeah, this is a lady in Australia who's actually written a book on memory. And she's, I think she's won uh, it was international or national memory competitions, right? And I think the, the most common method is this memory palace, right? And this is the idea that you, you imagine your house and you put the different memories. Let's say it's a deck of cards. You have this card here on the entrance and then you walk in the other cards here and you make them a bit more exciting than just a card. So you, and you walk through and you remember the, the deck of cards in this random order. Now she could do this without imagery. And so I asked her, how does she do it? She said, well, I don't use my house or anything visual. I use the spatial layout of my neighborhood and the roads and where houses are and trees. And she has perfect or near perfect spatial layout. But the weird thing is when I think of space, I think of objects in space and she doesn't. She just has these points in space, but they're perfectly laid out. And this ties in with experiments we've run on, on, on measures of mental rotation or spa questionnaires on spatial abilities. And people with aphantasia score as well or sometimes better than people with imagery. So there seems to be the spatial layout of things seems almost perfectly maintained despite the object imagery not being there. Yeah, exactly. So, and as we know, uh, you know, uh, Ed Catmull did all these things with patents of how you make, uh, a, a, let's say, a hand out of little patches of space and where the light bounces off and what color the light carries and all that stuff. Aphantasic. He didn't <laughs> yeah, yeah. picture it, but he understood the phys you know, the the physical sense of it, like, oh, there's the thing, and that's what's bouncing off of it. So I happen to be mostly aphantasic. I'm much closer to that end of the spectrum. And so I totally get it about this lady saying, okay, look, if I'm if I'm imagining my neighborhood, I know the feeling that this is over to this side of that, and that's over here, and that's behind me. But I'm not picturing it particularly well. I just, but I, I have a clear sense of three dimensional space. Are, are there points in space, or are they just space existing? I feel like more it's just space existing, yeah, which is what I assume Ed has as well. Because yeah, you, uh, he probably told you, but you know, he first started realizing this when he was at a friend's house who's a meditator. Said, okay, I'd just picture a sphere in the air, and Ed just couldn't do it, and I can't do that either. I, it doesn't really make sense to me. But I can, of course, have a sense of a sphere. Like I could touch the sphere and whatever, but I don't. I don't have any particularly good picture of it. Yeah, the image of it. Yeah. I hear. I hear that so often. This someone does a meditation course and they say, "Picture this. Picture yourself." And they're like, "What? What do they mean? I can't do it." Do yeah, mean? my entire life, this this thing about count sheep to go to sleep, I didn't <laughs> understand. But can you do that? I mean, are you able to picture sheep as such? Yeah, I can. Like right. Yeah, I can. Yeah, he's, he's jumping over the fence or whatever. Yeah, I can. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's not, but let's be clear. Like, so, so it's not like if I'm seeing a sheep right now, it's not that strong, but I have a conscious experience of a sheep, the color. I have to kind of zoom in if I want to get the details 
of the face and the eyes. I can't get the details across the whole sheep simultaneously. There's a capacity kind of issue there. But I have a conscious experience of a sheep and I can make it move around in my mind's eye. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> What have you found about creativity? Yeah, so creativity is one of these things that oh, I get emails all the time, right? People saying, I couldn't be an artist because I have aphantasia. This is the reason why I couldn't be creative, right? And so we've run experiments on this. We haven't published the data yet, but in all the, there's all this sort of what we call divergent thinking tasks, right? Where you've got to come up with crazy ideas for a paperclip, as many as you can say in three minutes. So we ran a whole, got a whole of data, people with aphantasia, people with imagery, almost no difference. And in fact, on average, you know, slightly better in people with aphantasia. We ran convergent thinking tasks, the opposite, where people have to converge across the board, all these different things we ran. There's no evidence that people with aphantasia should be less creative. Give us an example of convergent thinking. Yeah. So that might be where you, so typically, so let's say you're, you're you know, you're in a, you're trying to come up with a new product or something in a meeting at work and you come up with all these crazy ideas, a hundred different ideas. Then you've got to converge all those crazy ideas down into say just five different things. So you've got a set of, will they work? Will they won't work? So we came up with a task to try and sort of get at the essence of that. And I thought that would show a difference because I was like, well, if you're trying to design a chair and you imagine a chair with three legs, it's going to fall over and I'm using my imagery because I have imagery, right? Then, then that's going to make show a difference. And it didn't. So we haven't been able to find any evidence that people with aphantasia are less creative. Again, with the ways in which we measure it. And there is some data, you know, large population data saying that generally speaking, people with aphantasia are more commonly found in sort of STEM science, technology, mathematical kind of jobs, and people with imagery are slightly more likely to be found in the creative industries. Again, don't know if that's causal, but there is that trend there that people have documented as well. I'll be interested to follow those numbers and see if they hold true, because this was the surprise for Ed when he realized that so many people at Pixar are aphantasia. Yeah. But there have been, there have been uh, we had an art exhibition in the UK, um, and all the artists had aphantasia. And there's, yeah. there's visual, there were sculptures, there's all you know, conceptual, you name it, and amazing art. So I, I don't think then there's no reason we can see or, or you know or, or have measured yet that there should be a deficit in creativity. And tell us about episodic memory. Episodic is episodes uh, in your life. So uh, your childhood memories, what I did last week, what I did last year. And so the way, one of the main ways of measuring this is with a type of interview. So we use a task like that where people have to sort of bring a memory to mind that was like one month ago, six months ago, one year ago, different sort of, we control, try and control as best we can the, the time. And we found that people with aphantasia come up with less details from their memory than people with imagery. And it was less vivid and a whole lot of things were different about the experience, but simply the, the, the objects in the memory they could name were less if you have aphantasia. It's not like catastrophically, dramatically different, it was clearly significant. So doesn't it, the memories are still there, but there is a clear difference. That doesn't surprise me at all. I, I have a very difficult time pulling up memories because I'm not picturing much of anything. As you know, I've done a lot of research on how we judge the passage of time. And so much of it has to do with how much footage you can bring up. So if you have a really exciting weekend and someone says, hey, how long has it been since Friday? You say, oh my God, it's been forever since I was at work on Friday because this happened, that happened. But um, so it makes me wonder if people with hyperphantasia feel as though they've lived longer because they've got all this memory, they all this footage they can draw on. I think, I mean, so that's true. Have you, have you ever done the float tank? I haven't. Oh, so that's one of the things where I completely lose track of time. Yeah. But I, I got my thoughts, I get into these deep spirals of thoughts and this, and I'm imagining this thing. It's all, I'm not hallucinating because people say they hallucinate in the float tank. And then I think, well, it's probably been five minutes. And then like 50 minutes is up like that. And I had completely lose track of time. But I think it's a really interesting thing. But I, yeah, I want to do this, this experiment now and see if, if hyperphantasics have like, if feel like their life has been much longer because every time they recall things, it gets these sort of high res images get jammed yeah. in. Yeah. So when they look for the footage, what happened since I saw you last time? Well, this, 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 yeah. this, this. It's been a month, yeah. That was my interview with Joel Pearson. And the bottom line is that there's a great deal of internal variety of experience, much more than any of us would naively expect. But what we learn with time and experience and scientific study is that when you introspect about what experience is like, all you can ever do is introspect on what your experience is like. 
As a scientific community, we're really just at the foot of the mountain on this topic. There's so much more exploration that has to be done to understand the differences in reality from head to head. Just as one example, a new study came out about what's called anendophagia, which is a lack of internal voice. So phasia refers to language. Endophagia means internal language. And anendophagia means a lack of internal language. Anendophagia. So it turns out you might have thought that everyone has the same degree of talking to themselves on the inside, but they don't. The loudness of your internal radio differs from head to head. And when this sort of thing gets subjected to study, you can see that people all the way at one end of the spectrum with anendophagia, no internal voice, they are worse at memorizing words because presumably they're not hearing the words over and over. And they're worse at recognizing rhymes that are written on a page but not heard because presumably if your brain is imagining how the words sound, you'll immediately pick up on rhymes even if they're not obvious like enough and stuff or though and foe and go. Anyway, I haven't studied this population yet, but they may well be better at some other things like Without the constraints of verbal thought, they might approach certain types of problems more creatively or unconventionally. Or maybe they're privileged in certain artistic abilities where visual experiences are more prominent. I don't know yet until we study this, but that's the kind of thing that one could look for. We all tackle the tasks of the world given the tools that we have. And this is a more general story, not just about our brains, but our bodies. We all have different genetic programs that unpack different bodies. Some taller, some shorter, some narrower, some wider. Some people are good sprinters and others are good marathon runners and on and on. But for the most part, all bodies say, cool, I'll just figure out how to use the machinery of the world chairs and cars and bicycles and surfboards and pogo sticks and so on. Some people have advantages for certain things like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar given his height for playing basketball or Michael Phelps, his wingspan for swimming. But for the rest of us, we cobble together our many different skills to manage our tasks in the world. And this is the way that we all find our way through the mental landscape. Whether you are someone who has internal visualization like a movie or instead just has concepts, you can both do art, you can develop different approaches to tackle that mountain, and more likely you even cobble together many different approaches. So when we talk about neurodiversity, it goes deeper than you think. Quite possibly, we are each a minority of one. Go to eagleman.com slash podcast for more information and to find further reading. Send me an email at podcast at eagleman.com with questions or discussion and check out and subscribe to Inner Cosmos on YouTube for videos of each episode and to leave comments. Until next time, I'm David Eagleman and this is Inner Cosmos. Inner Cosmos.